All right. We're gonna do it the scan away. I'm gonna suck your brain dry. The airlock is open and we have landed. Yes, the Mars Podcast is back. This is Adario Strange here with Big Song. This week, we're going to talk about No Man's Sky, which was released earlier this month. And we're also going to get into a couple of the trailers that dropped this week, starting with The Arrival, the film directed by Denis Villeneuve. And he actually directed Sicario. Did you see Sicario? I've never even heard of Sicario. You've never heard of Sicario? Sicario is amazing. It's Benicio Del Del Toro as the most sinister, amazing assassin in the history of Mexican assassins. It's it's amazing. Sicario. Villeneuve is also working on uh, Blade Runner, which is coming up in 2017. And But his latest film is coming out on November 11th. And we just saw the trailer this week. It uh, stars Amy Adams, Jeremy Renner, and Forrest Whitaker. Uh, what'd you think? So this trailer had a very different look to it, uh, especially since, you know, first contact sci-fi movies. They're not, you know, they're a dime a dozen. So I really liked the shot of the alien mothership coming. Like, it's, a, it's kind of a wide shot, and it kind of looks like a giant egg. I think from the trailer, what's kind of unique about this particular story, which, you know, for those of you who don't know, it's based on a short story called Story of Your Life by Ted Chang, who is, uh, you know, he's written a couple of sci-fi short stories uh, and won a couple of awards for them. The unique take uh, about this is that it's kind of taken from a linguist's point of view. And in this movie, it's played by uh, the linguist as Dr. Louise Banks, and it's played by uh, Amy Adams. It's something that I don't think we think about uh, when it comes to first contact with aliens. How are we going to understand their language and how do we kind of translate we always just assume in, in sci-fi that the aliens are smarter than us, so they've like figured out human language way before uh, we can figure out theirs. But I think based on what we saw in the trailer, you know, these are some squid-like looking aliens based on that tentacle that like bangs up against the wall. So it might be just a... It, this movie seems like it's a linguist sci-fi nerd's dream. Yeah, I'm a little concerned because they show us a lot, I feel, in I think the trailer was about two minutes long. And usually a movie like this, they don't show you the alien, like not even a, a part of the alien. I mean, I think this is kind of like a big problem with trailers in general. That is the idea of giving mm-hmm. away too much in the trailer. But it's hard to tell whether it's going to be something that's really high concept that just gets really convoluted. But I'm I'm hopeful, like. Forrest Whitaker is solid. Jeremy Renner is solid. Uh, Amy Adams does some good work, too. So, Well, so that is, again, November 11th, 2016, this year. And again, Villeneuve, the director, is also the person working on Blade Runner. So moving on, we uh, you found a story that was, uh, I'm going to say, terrifying. Well, why don't you just break it down? This has to do with transhumanism becoming very, very real. Yeah. So the Washington Post ran this interview with uh, a man named Brian Johnson. And he's interesting because he has this startup called Kernel. And, you know, they're based in Venice Beach, which, like Snapchat, which we talked about last last week, uh, is based in set Venice Beach as well. And what this startup is doing is that they're building a tiny chip that can be uh, planted into your brain. And the whole idea behind it is that it's going to help people who are suffering from, like, cognitive, uh, either cognitive diseases or damage. So things like strokes, Alzheimer's disease, possibly concussions. Um, so they're calling it a neuroprosthetic and they're hoping that what it'll do is that it'll boost your, your smarts, your memory, other things that you use your brain for. And one of the things is that that their chief science officer is this guy named Theodore Berger and he's a biomedical engineer and he, he works at the university of Southern California and he's done a lot of work in this field and the whole, like the science behind it is that uh, these devices and this chip, it tries to kind of mimic the way that your brain cells communicate with each other. So, you know, when you have Alzheimer's or you have dementia 
or just something where your brain's not working properly, it's mostly because the signals, the electric signals in your brain are misfiring. And supposedly the tech behind this chip is that it fixes the signal so that it works properly. No way. When I read this, I thought there was like a part where they, they were saying the inspiration for this was that it that there was a specific uh, brain malady that it was addressing. Well, the ones that they, they pointed out in the article were like strokes, Alzheimer's, and concussions. So, um, you know, what this reminded me of was when we talked a few weeks ago about uh, that Pew Research Survey, where it says that the general populace is kind of unnerved by uh, transhumanism. Uh, one of the things that they I, that we kind of zeroed in on was the fact that people are absolutely fine when you're using these transhuman uh, technologies to cure diseases, but it's when you take the leap from curing diseases to turning normal functioning people into superhumans that, you know, discomfort sets in. So with Colonel, this is starting out very much in the, like the medical field of helping people whose brains are no longer functioning the way they should. And where they hope to take it in the future is to enhance and boost our cognitive abilities. So this is exactly like writing that line that we talked about. And it's writing the line of where people are feeling most uncomfortable with transhumanism. Yeah, and he says in the article, he says, uh, the founder of the company says, human intelligence is landlocked in relationship to artificial intelligence. And the landlock is the, de the degeneration of the body and the brain. And so, I mean, he's speaking, I mean, that's it. That's the, the transhuman, you know, uh, theory right there is just, you know, just transcending that gap between artificial intelligence and computers and the, uh, the weak flesh, as it were. Yeah. I don't know. I think, um, when we talk about the singularity, and I, I feel like I've mentioned this before, but I'll say it again. I, when we talk about the singularity, we often mention computers, artificial intelligence systems. I honestly think that this is probably how the singularity will come about before any uh, self-aware computer is, you know, comes to be. I think we'll probably have, you know, let's just say, um, okay, I'm just going to go sci-fi with it. Let, we'll, we'll have a version of the Borg, um, not necessarily murderous <laughs> people, but people who have brain implants who can communicate wirelessly with one another. Because, you know, once you start down this path, I mean, how can you not include the value add of communication? I mean, you've got, you know, the components in your head. Why not, you know, make it uh, possible to, to, to communicate? So let's say you have, you know, a group of people uh, in the hospital, in the rehab facility, wherever they're at learning to, you know, walk and talk and speak again with this chip in their head. They're just looking at each other and communicating. That's going to happen. Yeah. And that's really fascinating because once you have people with chips and people without chips, you just create like factions within people. And if you can, if like, let's say you and I get the chip and we can talk together uh, telepathically through this chip and there's someone in the room who doesn't have the chip and they can't get in on the conversation. That's just, that just seems like Tinder and sparks waiting to happen to blow things up into conflagrations of conflict. Well, not Tinder the app. You mean Tinder for a fire. Yes. Not everything is an app. <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, yeah. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so this is fascinating. I mean, did he detail any, like, uh, launch information, dates, prices, you know, what the timeline is? No, he didn't do, at least not that I saw, uh, in terms of a launch and a timeline. But what I did see is that there have been separate studies done by DARPA on Berger, and he's the chief science officer and this brilliant dude who kind of, you know, pioneered this neuro neuroprosthetic uh, idea. Uh, so they've done studies about the effectiveness of his chips, and what they're finding is that it's improving recall functions in rats and monkeys. Now, rats and monkeys are not humans, but... That's that's the first step to making it work in humans. Yeah, I would totally chip up. No <laughs> doubt. Like, no, I would have no – I would chip up in a heartbeat. Just show me – give me human trials. Let's say I'll need – I'd need at least five, five – minimum five years of human trials where, uh, you know, someone's brain doesn't just short circuit and you see them, you know, kind of, I don't know, convulsing 
you know, in in the mall somewhere because they have this defective chip in their head. Yeah, just give me five years of like uh, worry free use in someone. Yeah, I, I would chip up if it meant um, faster and better recall. Just, you know, I mean, again, you know, we talked about this uh, in our transhumanism episode. You know, some people are using are experiencing these effects just uh, through medication. Well, you know, it'll be a cognitive arms race because if you get it and then you're just spouting off brilliant things left and right and I'm just with my puny organic brain, I'm going to want to get it, too. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and then if you put that person next to a Stephen Hawking or, you know, let's just, you know, other people who are considered, you know, organically brilliant, then what happens? You know, I mean, this again, a lot of brilliance isn't just the ability to calculate and think logically. It's the ability to make leaps between logic chains and to imagine, you know, various things. So it's not just about IQ. But I mean, you know, some of these brilliant people who are lauded are sometimes less than brilliant in terms of creative thinking. And so it may begin to blur the lines between who is truly brilliant and who is just uh, enhanced. Would you chip up? Um, I feel like I would have to chip up, you know, like I don't want to be I'm not so married to the idea of this is my body and it was born this way and some higher entity intended me to be this way. I'm not so married to that. If like, you know, if, if enough people start chipping up, that's going to affect the workforce and mama needs to make a paycheck. (laughs) Mama needs to make a paycheck. Yes. Mama does indeed need to make a paycheck. And if that requires chipping up, mama going to need that chip. And she's going to expense it. (laughs) So uh, moving from artificial brilliance to organic, old school brilliance, we saw a pretty cool trailer this week um, for a new movie coming out called Hidden Figures. And uh, this is a story of several black women who worked at NASA uh, in the 50s and 60s. And let's I'll just read the synopsis that um, came out with the trailer. It, this is the incredible untold story of Katherine Johnson a mathematician and physicist, Dorothy Vaughn and Mary Jackson, uh, brilliant African-American women working at NASA who served as the brains behind one of the greatest operations in history, the launch of astronaut John Glenn into orbit. And playing the various roles, we have Taraji P. Henson uh, as Katherine Johnson. Uh, You guys out there may know Henson for her uh, most recent work in Empire. Cookie. <laughs> yeah, Cookie and Empire. So she's going to go from Cookie to a genius. So that'll that'll be interesting to see, to watch. Uh, Dorothy Vaughn is uh, being played by Octavia Spencer, who some of you out there may know from her work in The Help, um, her award-winning work in The Help. And very interesting, um, Mary Jackson, the role of Mary Jackson is being played by singer Janelle Monet. Are yeah. you aware of Janelle Monet? Uh, you... I love Janelle Monet. She is. I'm going to call her like, so I'm, I'm early Janelle Mole, Monet. I'm calling it. I was, I was in early. I'm, I think she is possibly one of the few science fiction oriented musicians that we have out there. She is completely obsessed with science fiction. Uh, you can hear it in her work. You hear it in her music and her music videos. She's got at least two videos uh, where she's like some sort of robot, you know, Android. She loves sci-fi. Um, so this is a great, but I, I mean, I know her m- mostly as a musician. So seeing her in an acting role. You know, she looks solid in the trailer. I was, you know, when I saw that it was Janelle Monae, I was like, wait, can she act? Is this stunt casting? But she seems to hold her own in the scenes that we see. So I'm pretty excited for that. And just some background on one of the women uh, from history being portrayed, Katherine Johnson. Uh, she was a mathematician and a physicist, and she calculated the flight trajectory of the first American in space, uh, that being Alan Shepard, in 1959. In 1962, um, she helped NASA to calculate uh, using uh, computers uh, along with her own skill to calculate John Glenn's orbit around Earth, which I'm assuming that's what the film is based on. And then she also calculated the trajectory for the 1969 Apollo 11 uh, mission to the moon. So this is like a real 
a story of real people who I had no idea existed. I feel very bad that I had no notion. Well, it's not you, Adario. It's like, I don't feel like it's the public's fault that we don't know about these people. Like the man trying to hold them down. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> and, you know, actually watching this trailer, uh, it, it awoke some social justice fire inside of me a little bit uh -oh. because it was kind of, you know, watching it, I was I was thinking, you know, we can't ever have the excuse when we look at period dramas anymore that people of color just were not around. Right. Because they were. And they were right. doing amazing things. So there were a ton of people. Well, not maybe not a ton, but there were significant, uh, important, vital people out there who um, were of color. Uh, be it black, Asian, Hispanic, uh, you know, out there in the trenches, uh, quietly doing work who, you know, aren't always recognized uh, by the history books. So this is a, a, a nice uh, nod to some, at least for me, and I think many others, uh, little known history uh, regarding our adventures in space, our, our penetrating the, the sky and moving to the next level. The question yes. for me to you this came off to me as as great as the intention is and as uplifting as it you know it seems it kind of felt a little um i don't know how should we say a uh, service you know when you say service journalism it fe it almost felt like service cinema in other words i'm i'm a little worried if this will be interesting enough beyond just the amazing story of these women i mean Great. You know, I'm, I, I, you know, if this was a documentary, I'm in automatically. Like I'd watch this documentary in a heartbeat as a drama. Mm, I'm not so sure. I mean, well, you know, that'll just really depend on the writing and the script. So if we go into the movie and it's kind of note by note, beat by beat, like I'm about to dump on a movie, but if it's like the imitation game, I did not enjoy that movie. That was the movie that came out a uh, I want to say a year or two ago, starring Benedict Cumberbatch about Alan Turing. So this could kind of be like that, in which it just feels like it's Oscar bait going through the motions of what people think an uplifting film will be. But, you know, if they tackle the social issues of the time and what it was like to be not only Black, but a Black woman trying to do these amazing STEM related uh, calculations and trying to forge these careers, like that could be really compelling and really interesting to see. And I think the thing that makes me hopeful is that it, they're not just focusing on Katherine Johnson, the Taraji Henson character solely. They're not just focusing on her, they're focusing on three black women. And it's showing that there wasn't just one, like she wasn't like, I don't know, a needle in a haystack. There were more than one of her. To your point about, you know, it'll d depend on how it's handled. The director is Theodore Melfi. I've never heard of him. Uh, apparently, he directed a film uh, before this in 2014, St. Vincent, uh, starring, uh, I think, Bill Murray. Um, yeah, Bill Murray and Naomi Watts. I have no knowledge of this film. <laughs> I've never heard of this director. Uh, I vaguely remember mention of St. Vincent as a film. So he seems like maybe he comes from the indie world. You know, this, is, this seems like this is usually kind of like Spielbergian fare. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how he handles this. And yeah, you know, I mean, I trust Taraji P. Henson uh, and Octavia Spencer to kill it. I trust them. It's like you said, it's just a matter of the material. So we will see, uh, you know, if they can kind of take this amazing real life story and turn it into something that's engaging beyond documentary fare. And so finally, as promised, we're going to talk about No Man's Sky. This is the game published, uh, developed by uh, Hello Games, and it's available on PC, Windows PC systems and the PlayStation 4, the Sony PlayStation 4. And this is basically what this game is, is a procedurally generated universe, which means you enter a ship and you fly this ship throughout the universe endlessly as worlds are created in real time, uh, planets, uh, new star systems. Every planet is very realistic in terms of environment, uh, flora and fauna. Your ship has to be, you know, repaired and worked on. 
And the, the way the game is created is using algorithms that basically eliminate any need to create each scene as you move through it. Uh, which, which gives the, the game the ability to kind of basically be endless. And according to Hello Games, this game contains 18 quintillion planets. I've never even heard of the, the term that's, quintillion. That's 18 <laughs> zeros. Adario, 18 zeros. And, and one of the interviews about the game, one of the developers said that based on their estimates, uh, users of the game will visit, will miss 99% of planets. 99% of planets will never be visited. Now, just think about that for a second. That sounds like the real universe. I mean, if we had a starship capable of light speed like they have in uh, Star Trek, the best show on yeah, in yeah, the history yeah. okay. of science. <laughs> um, like if we had a starship capable of warp uh, travel, it's. I think it's likely that we would probably maybe get 1% uh, visit, be able to visit 1% of the planets in the universe. And so in that respect, this is a very, I think, ambitious and possibly, at least in terms of scale, remotely realistic approach to what it would really be like to travel the universe and visit like alien world endlessly. So now you had a chance. I have not had a chance to play the game, but you, Vic, you had a chance to play the game this week. Uh, again, it was released August 9th. A lot of people are still, you know, reviews are out. A lot of people are, you know, have their own takes on it. Uh, you have had limited play. Yes. What, what, what say you? It's really kind of bizarre. It's, it's hard to describe. So I'm going to, cause I know you haven't played it. So I'm going to try and describe it to you. So when you play the game, when you initially start out, uh, you basically you land on a planet, and I think everyone who plays the game, you land on a different planet. And the thing that remains the same is that your ship is broken. So you have to, straight off the bat, figure out how you're going to fix your ship, and you go around uh, fixing your ship by collecting resources, and you have like this multi-purpose tool that kind of looks like a gun in your hand, and you're running around the environment, which, you know, is topographically, I don't want to say like there's mountains and you get to climb a mountain. That's not true. But there's like, it's not all flat land. And so the planet I landed on was like this weird desert planet with flowering cacti everywhere. And it was really cold. Uh, so I, you know, my character is in, in, is in a space suit and there's like a gauge telling me how cold it is and, you know, when my suit's going to run out of battery. So I have these physical limitations as a character when I'm exploring and I have like objectives of things that I need to fix in my ship before I can actually leave this world and explore other ones. And, you know, so I, I went running around for a little bit shooting cactuses so it would give me carbon and iron and I ran into a couple of derpy looking kind of animals kind of look like mini dinosaurs i they it's very strange looking but it really did feel like you're a pioneer in space and from what my friends who have played the game extensively tell me a lot of it is just kind of living the mun the mu mundane tasks of life on the go like you have to mine resources you have to figure out how much inventory and cargo you can hold on your ship like it's kind of a mix of exploring and pimp my spaceship because you have to figure out ways to upgrade your ship so that it can carry more things travel further you have to fix the hyperdrive and it, it in a really weird way it's kind of like if your life was just this aimless plotless thing of just traveling around the universe. Cause you mean like it really is yeah, <laughs> real life, <yeah>. basically. <laughs> Except, you know, slightly in the future where you can actually travel to things in, in a tiny spaceship because you don't really have a big spaceship. It's Your spaceship is basically big enough for you and some crap that you found. Or at least that's what you start out with. You can upgrade your ship. And now I know you, you've had limited play, mm -hmm. but beyond the exploration aspects and the mining and the, you know, the right. creatures that you encounter... I mean, this is a silly question. I have to ask it, though. Like, is, are there any other realistic things? Like, is there a health monitor? Do you go to the bathroom? Do you age? Like, do you know um, any of that? I don't think you go to the bathroom, and I don't think you age, but there is health. So um, you have this, like, funky jetpack, so you can kind of fly, but not well. It's very awkward. So I like games, but I am terrible at them. 
I was not indoctrinated early with uh, a Nintendo Game Boy or anything like that. So uh, I, uh, 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 I disagree. You you may be terrible at games, but you're talking about video games. Board games is another matter. Board correct? Ga- you are absolutely right. I am bomb diggity at board games <laughs> okay. and tabletop gaming. But video games, I just don't really have great reflexes. So um, one thing I'll do in games is that if there is any type of platform or 3D terrain and it requires jumping, I will die, <laughs> like, super, or I'll injure myself or my character. So um, I was trying to fly around or figure out how this jetpack worked, and I landed badly a couple of times and, and knocked myself some injury. Um, and there is, you know, there there are notifications that pop up that, that are, like, your exoskeleton is, like, you only have 50% power left. You might want to get back to your ship, that kind of stuff. Yeah, and so one thing that I'm thinking, I haven't read a ton of reviews. I've only read a couple uh, about the game. But one thing I don't feel like I'm seeing reported to my question just now is, I guess this means in the game you're immortal. You're basically an immortal being traveling the universe. I mean, in other words, if if it's infinite, I, I know we're talking about a video game, but, mm-hmm. you know, so much of the video game is based on, you know, I, I listened to one uh, interview with one of the uh, developers, and a lot of it is based on how planets actually age and how wind really affects the terrain and how mm-hmm. the sunlight, you know, actually allows, you know, certain creatures and plants to grow and, and the distance of a planet from its sun, you know, uh, impacts, you know, what that planet is like. And so I was just kind of expecting maybe there might be some variable that also spoke to the player. You know, so it would be kind of cool. And maybe this exists. Maybe we just haven't dug into the game enough. But it would be kind of cool if they were also there were notes that kind of said you are this immortal being or something, you know, because that's, you You know, know. that's that's an interesting point, because I don't think anyone's tried to kill themselves in this game yet. (laughs) Oh, I'm that I'm sure that's happened. Someone must have gone out into the into the void of space and just said, "Okay, let's just see if I just say screw it. But before we get too dark, let's just keep like going (laughs) on some of the more interesting parts of this. So one. So well, I want to take us back for a minute. About a year ago, I saw the trailer for this game. Um, for No Man's Sky. And that was my first knowledge of this. And I mean, I was just, when I understood what I was watching, I really lost it because I, I just, I was so excited. Um, a- again, about a year ago, they showed the trailer and they show the worlds being created in real time. And the trailer gave us like it wasn't just like um, some of the uh, video footage that you're seeing now will kind of take you through a somewhat boring five, 10 minute clip of someone actually using the game. But the original trailer I saw was like very well cut. So it showed you different little missions and, and different sceneries and vistas and and, you know, how the ship was actually traveling through space. And when they added the note that this was almost, you know, essentially infinite. And all of a lot of this was be, being created uh, in real time. I, you know, I was I was just fascinated, and like many others, uh, I wondered, okay, this is amazing. This is close to what we've always dreamed of in terms of simulating uh, space exploration, you know, and, and beyond the solar system, like deep space explora- exploration. But can we get it in VR? And the answer is, at least for now, no. However, um, there is a VR injection driver called Vorp X. That's V-O-R-P-X. And uh, one user managed to get it working um, with his HTC Vive. And there's actually a clip on YouTube of him using No Man's Sky, using this VR hack. And, I mean... <laughs> The, the the joy and giddiness expressed by this gamer is just, I mean, that's almost half of the fun watching the video. But I get it because when you see a VR experience that's just really immersive and fascinating, that's one thing. I can't imagine using, you know, No Man's Sky in VR. That that would, you know, that seems like that's the next level. In, in a way, No Man's Sky, from what I've played of it, I think it's the perfect video game for VR. It's like the perfect platform because not only is it discovery and exploration based, it's just, you know, um, there's just lots of terrains to explore. There's different textures and different 
like the the planet I landed on had it wasn't like normal sand. It was kind of like a pinky sand with very strange cacti living there. So that would be it would be really cool to just be able to walk around in real time and, you know, point at something like because the the mining gun thing that you start out with, it looks like a laser gun and you just get resources from it. So that would be cool because you have to find things like the whole point is looking for and finding things and interacting with your environment. So that's, that's really just perfect for VR and just like the mindlessness of it, because there is no overarching plot to, to no man's sky. There, there's, there is a sense of a greater world. So like depending on how you interact with the fla- uh, the fauna and the flora. So if you're really greedy and you just start killing animals and like plants willy nilly, you'll you'll attract the eye of of the of something called the sentinels. Oh yeah, the drones, right? The yeah. drones will come and police you, police yeah. your behavior. Yeah, but you know, kind of like uh, it's about to happen down here. Yeah, on Earth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you know, <laughs> so are we living in no man's sky in the past, Adario? We'll get to that. Uh, but first, <laughs> I have one one more question. Do you get a name in this game? Uh no, you're I think you're called Traveler. Like your name is not necessarily important. You you will see the names of the planets that you go to and they'll tell they'll even tell you things like like the moisture is if there's a lot of moisture, if there's not a lot of moisture, what the temperature is. Like those sorts of uh that data is something that you'll see, but there's also like a tool, I think a scan, I think it's called a scanner and that starts out broken, but once you fix it, you can use it to to find and catalog different things that you come across. So in a way, you're kind of like Darwin and Jane Goodall in space. I, I feel like, and again, you know, I'm not entirely sure. It seems like you still have some time to spend in the game. So maybe this is part of the game and we just don't know. But if it's not, I feel like they maybe they're missing something because if they're going to give all this, you know, cool names and specific data for all these planets... Wouldn't it be cool if every player could name themselves whatever they name themselves and their age could actually be represented in the time that they spent in the game? And so then when you have like a massive multiplayer ver- version of this, you can have like immortals battling each other and you can, you know, you know, mm. meet someone who's 2000. Yes, this is, you know, you know, uh. Aaron X, and he is five thousand years old. He has he has visited fifty planets, and and you know you're you're Vic, and you've only visited five, and you're only two hundred years old. You know something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so the thing about No Man's Sky is it's kind of like um, a game that's played by a lot of people by themselves. So it's kind of like we're all alone together in a really right. so weird I, way. Like right. So I'm imagining like the next iteration where a massive. Oh, okay a massive online player of this. The the game as it is now, like you can, as far as I know, like you can share coordinates with your friends and kind of see where your friends have gone. But by and large, you don't really interact with each other. Right. So, but that's what I mean. So the next, to me, the next logical step is, uh, I use the massive, uh, on the, you know, what was it? MMO massive multiplayer online version of this. And I'm traveling by myself in the void of space. I have my coordinates for my next planet. And as I'm traveling, I see an, an odd glint in the distance that seems unlike a star. And I decide to make a detour and then we communicate over radio. And it turns out it's another traveler who is maybe living in Russia, like, but a real person. And, you know, again, his name is Aaron X and he's 5,000 years old. And I'm, you know, I mean, would, I mean, isn't wouldn't don't you think that would take it to the next level? I think that would give the game longevity because there's only so much that the average person can explore planets by themselves before exactly, this yeah. game is like because there is no overarching plot. There right. is no most games have a story to them. Well, the plot is is survival basically, right? Yeah. But, you know, like in real life, survival will only take you so far before you right. get real bored. The milk of human kindness is needed to sustain oneself in the void of space. Yes. Yes, it is. Very much so. Or, like, it would be cool if you could meet aliens. Like, sentient aliens. Not Because technically the flora and fauna, they're alien. But, you know, sentient aliens that can actually talk to you. Now, as 
I think there are alien races in the game that are NPCs or non-playable characters, but they're not like things that you can really interact with on a really substantive level. And that, yeah, and that's why I was saying it would be like I thought of that, and that's why I was saying it would be better if you could meet other players uh, randomly, because you know if all of this is created on the fly, I imagine that to create unique characters that are believably intelligent and can respond in real time to your interactions. I imagine that's, that would take a lot of, a lot more heavy lifting than it would than to just, you know, connect a bunch of other, you know, players. Yeah. And if you could just connect with someone anywhere across the world through this game, that would just, that would, that would blow my mind on two levels because not only are you actually playing with someone somewhere in the world, but you could actually form a relationship in a simulated reality with someone who is real. Right. Like, right. that would just... And then just imagine if this became like a normal thing in terms of, you know, meeting people in this uh, virtual universe, endless virtual universe, but with real coordinates for real made up planets. Uh, I think in short order, well, not in short order, maybe over the course, like, let's just imagine that the game lasted 10, 20, 30 years. And some games do last that long. I mean, I think Grand Theft Auto has been around for a couple of decades now, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, so there are people who have Grand Theft Auto dreams. That's how long, you know, that's been around and it's, it's pretty old. So, I mean, let's just say that, that, you know, this game lasts, has some longevity. I don't think it's inconceivable that you would have some of these planets with real coordinates in this virtual universe that become populated. And then inevitably there's either trade or war. And, but I mean, to, to do these things, you actually have to, again, jump in your ship and travel however, you know, many hours or days or weeks that it takes to get to these other places. I mean, the, you know, the if you involve interaction, human interaction in this game, you know, then things get, I think, really, really interesting. Oh, wow. Like, I, I didn't even think about that because then you'd essentially be living double lives because you yeah. have your life here where, you know, you go to a day job and you do the things that get you the moolah and then you go home and you live your second life. And when do you sleep? You don't sleep. Well, yeah, but you know, who wants to sleep when your second job is taking over Alpha Centauri 9 with your or, other two cohorts? Or you'd sleep while you're in transit to Alpha Centauri 9 because hyperdrive. Well, yeah. There you go. Yeah, there so you that go. actually is a perfect lead into the other part of this story, which I'll introduce through our old friend Elon Musk. Uh, that Elon Musk is the founder of SpaceX, the very real SpaceX, the uh, company that is helping NASA supply the uh, International Space Station. And you may have seen some of his videos for uh, where he's there. They're basically developing rockets that are able to. Uh, fly off into space and then return uh, and land on platforms um, on their own, like automated landings. Uh, and then he's also the founder of Tesla, which is, I would say, probably the most famous electric car at this point. And they're, they're beautiful cars. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're, and, you know, they have their problems. There are some rough patches, but they're beautiful cars um, and they're only becoming more popular. So Elon Musk, uh, on the day that No Man's Sky was released, August 9th, he tweeted this, quote, we'll try out No Man's Sky this weekend. Maybe reality is just a series of nested simulations all the way down. But basically what he was really referring to was simulation theory. Now, Elon Musk has mentioned simulation theory frequently in the last couple of years. And what's interesting is when he does bring it up, well, when he initially began to bring it up, I feel like the first time I heard him bring it up in public was either late 2014 or 2015. Maybe he did it earlier. But it seemed like uh, some people chuckled and thought he was kind of being a little quirky. And then he just kept mentioning it. He kept saying, you know, <laughs> oh, simulation theory. Maybe maybe we're not living in a real world. Uh, maybe this is all just a simulation. And so this has led some people to kind of reexamine uh, simulation theory. And again, simulation theory as a concept has been around for a very long time, but one of the most famous uh, ex explorations into the notion 
was published in 2003 by an Oxford professor by the name of Nicholas Bostrom. And the paper was titled, Are You Living in a Computer Simulation? Well, the, the paper basically sums itself up like this, quote, the basic idea of this paper can be expressed roughly as follows. If there were a substantial chance that our civilization will ever get to the post-human stage and run many ancestor simulations, then why aren't you living in such a simulation? And so kind of to reverse unpack that, basically the idea being if we can somehow uh, move from our still pretty violent, primitive stage of war and move in tru- into a truly global transhuman era where most of our effort is devoted to, you know, uh, the pursuit of knowledge, you know, computing, you know, uh, you know, advances in science, that kind of thing. Doesn't it stand to reason that we would be able to create, com- particularly based on what we have now with, you know, these video games that are increasingly real, uh, hyper real? Uh, it doesn't it stand to reason that we would be able to create a uh, a procedurally a procedurally generated universe um, with real time thinking characters that have their own lives, kind of basically the Sims on all kinds of steroids. Just um, just take the Sims and drop it into the universe of No Man's Sky and imbue it with artificial intelligence, and then the question is, okay, then. Are we sure that's not us? Well, it's hard. You can't really be sure. I mean, you could pull a Rene Dark Descartes and be like, I think, therefore I am. But to be honest, you know, I used to go around and think that, you know, um, the one way I could tell I wasn't in some story or some sort of simulation was the fact that I have to deal with bodily functions every day. It, to me, it stands to reason that if you're going to go through the trouble of you know, making these characters have sex and go out to eat and, and dance. Why not also make them poop? Yeah, no, it's it's a real thing. Your like, poop is not real. It's simulated poop. No, I'm just joking. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like, you know, in most games that we have now, you know, the characters never like you brought this up when you asked about No Man's Land. Like most you don't take bathroom breaks. You don't have to do that sort of stuff. It's you do see it in some games, but not not to the extent that you would think. So, you know, mosquito bites, that's not a real thing that you see in a lot of games. You know, it's just kind of like a cleaner, sanitized um, presentation of life that you get because, you know, you don't have to deal with an itchy bug bite. You don't have to deal with like bowel movements. In, in yeah. Game. But if, if we've already been doing all of this for thousands of years, wouldn't we program these sensations and behaviors into our creations? Oh, our, our character just got bitten by a tiny bug. It should itch. There should be a rash. A little bump should form now. So I have a, like a real question about that, though, because if you become an advanced society and you can create a simulated reality, why would you want to include the unpleasant things if you could, you know, cut that out? You know, when you're simulating, you know, the way people live, I don't know why you would think that people would only simulate the positive things. Well, it's not the, like I, I understand that for one for, for like uh, reality's sake and like hyper realism, you would include the not so great things. But if you become an advanced enough civiliz- civilization that you can craft the perfect world, like would you? Like you have a choice to. Well, no, no, isn't that the question of the Matrix? Yeah, well, you you took that right <laughs> from me. You, you know? Oh, I'm sorry. Were you were? Is that where you were going? Yeah, I was going oh, there. Oh, I'm sorry. Like, eventually, I don't I don't know when I was going to get there, but like obviously, when we talk about um, simulated theory, uh, was it simulation theory? Like in terms of sci-fi, the closest thing that we have is the Matrix. You know, um, where Keanu Reeves was living a boring, mundane life before he realized uh, he was not actually living that life, but he was a naked man in a pod that machines were using basically him as a battery for. So, you know, ostensibly in the movie, he had to do things like poop and pee and all eat and deal with hunger, even though he didn't have to. But the machines were doing that to him to keep him dumb. So, are, so I just... You know, it's really confusing because if we have No Man's Sky, that's presenting an idealized reality. 
where you don't have to deal with some, like you do have to deal with the mundane things of like repairing things, things break down, things age, things degrade, but you don't have to deal with like the, the things that are super annoying. Like there's no question of death so far, like your own personal death. And like, I think that's just a matter. I think that's just a detail. I don't think that, I don't think you are speaking to the, the fundamental approach. I think that that will probably come. I think the logical progression is yes, you know, human interaction within the game, uh, aging, sickness for the players. Because if you have planets, like, again, remember, like, if you take too many resources, the drones come and try to stop you. So that's an indication that, mm-hmm. you know, the planets will suffer if you treat them incorrectly. So I'm sure that the, the notion, you know, when they can get to that development level within the game, uh, the developers, uh, Hello Games, I'm sure they would apply the same thing to humans or to to the you know to the people driving the ships. So, but then I, you I just log think that out. like if you get like no one wants a character who's like sick or at least some. Yeah, but that's people part would, of the game. But some people would yeah some people would stick with that. But if you're a certain type of gamer who may not want to deal with that sort of thing, you could just log out, and then what happens to that character? Now I have to get simplistic and and go to Mortal Kombat. I mean, when you're fighting Raiden and, you know, you're losing, that little bar goes down because you're getting hit too many times. That doesn't – you don't just throw your your controller down and say, okay, I'm done. You keep trying to fight to see if you can survive long enough to beat him. Even, and I've had, you know, battles in, in those kind of games where my life force was like a very tiny little bar, like a little silt – like a – tiny sliver of red life and uh just at the end i managed to win and defeat you know the opponent and go on to the next level so there's nothing to say that the same thing wouldn't happen in an advanced you know future version of no man's sky where let's say you've dropped you know 80 pounds you only have you know uh you know bread crusts left to eat you have very little water and you have a week until you get to the next planet which is a water planet that has fruit that you can consume. You've confirmed that there is edible fruit on that planet. Okay, well, do I go into hibernation? Because maybe there's a hibernation mode in, in this iteration of the game. Do I go into hibernation? But will I die in hibernation? Uh, is there, you know, is there some hack that I can use to get me to the next? I mean, these are questions that I think, you know, again, assuming the game is around, I think it would fascinate some players. I, I guess my question to you is just, why are you know to the to the question uh, from Professor Bostrom? Is it, uh, why are you sure that we're not in a simulation? I mean, is it is it just that you uh, go to the restroom and perhaps have an unpleasant experience? <laughs> I, mean, oh, well. I have great fun in the bathroom, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I have no problems there, so I, um, I don't know. Well. Maybe you need a software patch. Maybe maybe you need to yeah, get the, maybe uh, the I need I maybe I need the day one <laughs> patch that makes my blood bat no. Let's not go there. <laughs> anyway, um, no, um, I'm not sure uh, to put it. I guess the idea that I can't log out and still live. Well, I don't know. Like, you know, this is going to get dark. But I, I don't, I can't log out from my current life unless going to sleep is logging out. You know, maybe that's actually it. This is why this question keeps being presented because there is no viable answer. No one can prove or disprove the question, the answer to the question either way. No one can say with any certitude that we aren't living in a simulation and no one can prove it yet. But the very existence of No Man's Sky is, I think, a hint that this theory, this simulation theory is not so far out. Well, I'll take it a different way. So if, you know, part of what Bostrom's paper deals with is just kind of thinking about other realities or rather other uh, intelligent species that may be elsewhere. And has this happened before? Has this all played out before? Has an intelligent society gotten to a certain level? All, all if, if what we're saying here on, on this planet in 2016 about simulation theory that Okay, No Man's Sky somehow hints that simulation theory is rooted in a possible reality that means, you know, either we are in a simulation or we will create a simulation where 
however many hundreds of years in the future, people will live full lives and age and have sex and poop and walk dogs and fight and kill each other and think they're living real realities when in fact it's just us pulling the strings from our advanced stages as a species. If that's not the case, right? If we aren't capable of doing this, and if, for instance, let's just say, I think, okay, I think the underlying fear, because, you know, let's be honest, we're still fairly, we, we fight wars, we kill each other, we're still fairly primitive. I think the underlying fear with the very question itself is the idea that, once again, which something we think about a lot, is that we're alone. Mm-hmm. Meaning if there is no other intelligent life in the universe, I think it's I think we're getting to the point where we can kind of assume that there are other forms of life somewhere, even if it's just primitive forms. So at this point, I think the the more fair question is it, it, intelligent life. So if there's no other intelligent life in the universe and if it's just us on this planet, you know, reaching this level where we have these game simulations and virtual reality. I mean, that I I do think I can understand why someone might ask or might hope or wonder about simulation theory, because if it is just us, it's kind of sad and scary, because I think, you know, the idea that we'll even get to a point that we're so advanced that we could create, you know, a virtual world where people who aren't actually people live incredibly full lives and they're realistic lives and they think that they're really living For us to get to that level, we're going to have to exist, I think, for a good deal longer, have a lot more peace, uh, at least enough peace to develop more, you know, more and better technology. And um, I think, you know, some of the fear is that we won't get there. And so maybe that that hope is that either we're in the simulation or there are other intelligent worlds that have accomplished the simulation, meaning that, oh, we as a species will, you know, reach that point at, you know, at some far off date where we're intelligent enough to control uh, entire life, you know, entire worlds and basically become virtual gods. This is like, this is doing a number, this is doing a number on my brain. Like, I mean, there's a reason why philosophers and really smart people have been like chewing this idea around for a very long time, because I feel after all of our going back and forth and thinking about it, what the answer that we're kind of hurtling towards is that there's absolutely no way to tell whether or not we're living in a simulation. Oh, yeah, we know that. But before I get off the major, I just want to mention before I forget. So one thing um, talking about, you know, philosophy and all this. The Matrix is what introduced me to the philosopher, the French philosopher, Jean Baudrillard. And if you pay close attention to the first Matrix, um, there's a book on Neo's bookshelf called uh, Simulacra and Simulation. And that's, an, you know, that's in the film, but that's an actual real book of philosophy um, by Jean Baudrillard. And a lot of his philosophy deals with the notion of simulated realities um, and totems and avatars and the world being kind of two worlds, the one that we see and the one that is represented by iconography and, and, and kind of um, and constructs. And so yeah, this is like, I mean, look, sure. Matrix revolutions wasn't great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I mean, there's a lot in the first Matrix and I think the second Matrix uh, that speaks to a lot of this, you know, talk about simulation theory and, you know, New- No Man's Sky, I feel, is that very first baby step toward, le- you know, let's be honest, what really could turn into a Matrix. And uh, Well, it's it's one that we know that has been created. I'm just wondering if we could ever... You know, maybe if you were aware enough, if you paid attention to the things that were happening in the background enough, whether you could actually, you know, see, you know, scratch against the surface of whether we, this level is simulated or not. Well, 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 let's think about that. I mean, this is, I had no plans to talk about the Matrix. I'm sorry, but I have to bring this up. Do you remember what happens in the Matrix when that, when that happens? When there's a glitch? Um, it's been a really long time since I've seen. Okay, so the little things repeat. 
So there's one like in the first Matrix, um, the, like something in the Matrix was was changed. The the, the construct of the building had been changed uh, on a cold level, and so Neo was walking up uh, some stairs. They're trying to escape from a building, and he sees a black cat pass the stairwell. And then he walks up a couple of steps and he looks back and then he sees the cat pass and walk in the exact same way. And that and throughout the rest of the films, that serves as an indicator. You know, when you see something very subtly repeat, that serves as an indicator that something is not right. Like this isn't this is a reminder that this world isn't real. And, uh, you know, the world is almost perfectly constructed, but there are still glitches. And I bring that up to just say. You know, I think that's part of the reason why people keep bringing up simulation theory, because there are still things that we see and experience that we often feel like we can't explain that seem like glitches in a possible matrix, whether it's, you know, coincidence or deja vu or meeting someone at just the right moment in just the right place. And the odds are like a million to one. And somehow you guys Maybe you already know each other. Maybe you both have two things the other person needs. And it's just almost impossible that you would meet at this time and place. And somehow you met. It's almost like a movie script. Wait, is it a movie script? Yeah. So I think you know, there are things that happen. And, you know, ghosts. You know, oh, we can yeah. take it all over the place, you know. I think everyone has felt that at some point. That, you know, you're seeing something that you can't explain. And you just write it off as as just you know oh i haven't slept enough oh my eyes were playing tricks on me what if it's not what if that is a glitch in the world and you're just witnessing code and you've been coded to kind of ignore it and forget about it i think this is the part of the podcast where we tell listeners to look behind them slowly but be careful now <laughs> no. <laughs> um no, no no that's a good point so i mean Look, this is, uh, was it a Mobius strip of philosophical exploration? There is no way, at least now, for us to know. But I do think part of, you know, aside from fear that we may be alone and, you know, that, you know, we, we kind of want someone else to, you know, have a proof of concept that, you know, we can move past our primitive state into transhumanism into some next level. Beyond that, I think, you know, just the idea or the the energy around this question, the attention around this question is just the hope that we will be able to make it happen, that that we will be able to create, you know, a simulated universe, a simulated world. And when a company like Hello Games comes even on a crude level this close, I think it's kind of – I think we know the answer now. Yeah. And if anybody – finds a glitch in this world and this simulated world, you know, feel free once you get out of it to come back and let me and Adario know what to look for. Again, if you're interested in No Man's Sky, it is out now for PlayStation 4 and for Windows PCs. Uh, no word on other platforms, at least that I've seen. Um, I'm going to start playing it very soon. Actually, before we call an end, you know, the thing that I'm thinking about too is like the style of this is like the wire in that what's more important is the journey as opposed to any particular goal or outcome. And I think when people look back at the wire, that is what they get out of the wire. The, I think the wire was like five or six seasons. Um, and there is no, I mean, there are particular storylines and there are, you know, story arcs, but the what what most people got out of the wire, I think, is the journey, the process. And so I say all that to say maybe that's what No Man's Sky is about. And maybe that is kind of almost like a, a metaphor for reality, assuming our reality is not simulated. That is the journey being the point as opposed to some end goal. Well, Dario, now I'm going to go uh, lie in bed and stare up at the ceiling for a while. Yeah. Or if you are like Vic Song, maybe it's just a good way to while away computer cycles as you figure out uh, your next strategy for that next weekend of, uh, I don't know, binge watching? Just binging. Yeah. Just binging? <laughs> going hard on one particular thing. Binging. Are you going to keep playing the game, by the way? I am intrigued enough to at least, you know, I, I want to see at least like 10, 20 worlds and then we'll see. If I'm hooked by that point, because if I'm not hooked, then, you know, 
I feel like once you get to the 20 world point, then you'll know whether or not the the spirit and the journey is speaking to you. Otherwise, you're just going to be like, yeah, I've seen everything. What's, what, what, what more is there to see? So we'll, we'll see how I feel at that point. So with that, we will call an end to this episode of the Mars Magazine podcast. You can access us, our information, uh, more information, other shows, like older episodes. A couple of weeks ago, we had David Harbour on from Stranger Things. Be sure to check that out if you haven't already. Uh, you can subscribe to the podcast on Stitcher, SoundCloud, iTunes, uh, Google Play, and we're also on YouTube. And if you want to see us on the Twitters, we're at twitter.com slash Mars Magazine. And the website is also marsmagazine.com. For the Mars Magazine podcast, this has been Adario Strange with Vic Song. And we will see you in the virtual, could be real or not real future. <laughs>